Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Heather. I'm on the marketing team here at Eagle Eye Networks. And today's topic for our webinar will be Eagle Eye's Bridge versus CMVR and what's the difference between them. I'll introduce you to your speakers today. We have uh, two members from our sales engineering team. We have Jody Russell, who has over 16 years of security integration experience as a system installer, manager, service provider, and designer. And we have our Ricky Mapp, who's been with the company for five years and has a deep understanding of the evolution of Eagle Eye Networks. And together, they're going to be presenting on our topic today. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ricky. Thank you, Heather. Um, Thanks for the warm introduction. Um, it seems like uh, just yesterday we were uh, starting uh, here in Austin, Texas. Um, so quick overview of Eagle Eye for the, uh, those that don't know. Uh, we were founded in 2012 by Dean Draco. Um, if you don't know of him, he's a great uh, Google search. Uh, he was the president and founder of uh, Barracuda Networks. Um, after that went public, he decided to uh, try his hand uh, in another industry um, and uh, he wanted to find a uh, video surveillance solution that you know really focused around uh, cybersecurity and also uh, ease of use um, if you've been in the industry for a while you'll you'll know that uh, you know setting up systems managing them is uh, it can be uh, quite daunting and so uh, you know with his leadership uh, we've uh, designed or and created a system that's very easy to use. Um, we are headquartered in Austin, Texas, but we also have offices in Tokyo, Amsterdam, and now Columbia. And uh, we serve customers in over 80 countries. So starting off, um, uh, the, the magic of Eagle Eye Networks uh, resides on uh, an on-prem device that we call either a bridge or a CMVR. Um, they're, they're identical in, in form factor most of the time. Uh, they look the same, they act the same, they connect the same. Um, and so there's you know, not really much to them on the outside. On the inside, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, you know, whether that be encrypting the video data, uh, transmitting it, um, managing the bandwidth, uh, and ultimately allowing you to view your videos uh, in, uh, from anywhere you are in the world. Uh, so long as there, there's internet. Um. Yeah, so all right, thank you, Rick, uh, Ricky. So uh, my name is Jody, I'm with the sales engineering team as well. Um, first off, thank you everyone for joining our webinar. And I do wanna say that we are going to have a live Q&A available. So if you have questions, you can put them into the chat, you can put them into the Q&A section, and we are gonna do our best to make sure that we're getting through each one of uh, those questions and, and getting them answered for you today. Uh, so let's start off with just talking about the bridge itself. As Ricky has already mentioned, we have two variations of the product that gets you to the cloud and gets you to that VMS experience, but they are two different uh, pieces of hardware with two different purposes. So the Eagle Eye Bridge, it's really only meant to facilitate the connection of the camera to the cloud. It's going to do it through an AES uh, encryption standard. We're encrypting the video in transmission and at rest both on the device and in the cloud. And then the device also has a 24 hour, or excuse me, a 24 to 48 hour video storage buffer built into it. We utilize that for intelligent bandwidth management and for complete control over how the device impacts your network. All bridges include a lifetime replacement, which is a, a very, uh, it's a very helpful feature because you, know, you don't wanna have to worry about your hardware that you've invested money in getting end of life and then having to make a new investment on additional hardware. You're paying for this as a VSAS, so that's a service. Part of that service is making sure that, that your system is always up and running. I like to think of this, Jody, as sort of like your cable box at home. Uh, your cable company relies on that cable box to provide you uh, the information that, you know, that you're requesting. And if that cable box breaks, um, you know, they're no longer able to pr provide that for you. So they're, right. they're more than happy to replace that, that, that for you. So yeah, the ultimate, here at Eagle Eye. the ultimate end goal is to, to get the video or get the movie to your house and the cable box just makes that happen. The ultimate goal for us is to get your video surveillance to the cloud and the bridge makes that happen. 
that's very correct. So in contrast, uh, if you're taking a look at a CMVR, uh, once again, most of the time it's the same form factor. Um, but the biggest difference uh, that you know it, uh, it all happens internally is there's a much larger video storage uh, uh, unit in there. Um, in all honesty, it's a, it's a hard disk drive. Uh, it's just much larger. Um, the reason that we designed the CMBR um, was because we know and understand and realize that not everybody has you know the amount of uh, upload bandwidth that is required to get all the required cameras up to the cloud. Um, you know, and you know because of that, we had to make a way, you know, design a way, invent a way uh, to keep the video locally longer. So that you know, whenever the user wanted to go and uh, access that footage, um, it was still somewhere, uh, even if it's local, uh, you know, or even if it's uh, on the local device, the video is, or the, the user was still able to access that video. Um, I get a question all the time: Is what does CMBR stand for? It's Cloud Managed Video Recorder. Um, not very, um, you know. It was, wasn't the, the most creative name, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it serves its purpose. And if anybody out there uh, knows who Javen Houston is, um, you can uh, thank him for coming up with that clever name. Thank you, Javen. <laughs> um, one thing here is uh, if you're looking at a CMBR and a <clears throat> and a bridge on your user interface, um, you're not going to be able to tell much of a difference. The only real difference in uh, that I can uh, that you'll see is in the camera settings. Uh, in the retention aspect there, it, it gives you the option uh, for how long you want to store video uh, locally. All right. Thank you, Ricky. So types of bridges and different types of CMVRs. Uh, as Ricky was, was saying that, you know, that the, looking at them either through the dashboard or even looking at them physically, the hardware chassis, you may not notice a big, big difference. But what we're going to start off with is talking through some of the different aspects of bridges and the model series that are available with bridges and then move over to CMVRs. So first we're talking about compact bridges. Compact bridges, they still have everything that is needed to facilitate that camera connection in a secured, intelligently mannered way. It's just going to provide you a lot more freedom of space uh, and the ability to take a very small device, put it in a, in a location without much of a footprint and get all of your video up to the cloud. Uh, so all of the same features that are there with the full-size bridge are still available with the compact bridge, which is the buffer, the redundant video buffer. Uh, you have the ability to encrypt the video. You're accessing it through the dashboard exactly the same. The main difference that we're looking at is the small form fanless chassis. So it's a much smaller device. It does not have a fan generating any sort of noise, but that does also mean that it you know, requires a certain amount of ventilation. Uh, this particular compact bridge series if you're looking at the three series or the three, you know, the, say the 305, for example, it has different types of chassis or different features. So we have an industrial temperature rated chassis. If you're going to be utilizing the device in hardened environments, we have a device that has a wireless cam LAN component, solid state drives. These are all things that, uh, that we realize over time were a necessary feature set to provide uh, for the different, all the different variations of solutions that, you know, the resellers are able to creatively put together. Ricky, are there any certain applications or considerations for compact bridges that come to mind for you? Definitely. So um, most of the time I see these compact bridges um, installed in areas um, such as, you know, fast food chains or retail stores, um, even office buildings, uh, but, but smaller office buildings. Uh, what's nice about them is you can pretty much install them anywhere. So you know, normally when you walk into a fast food chain's manager's office, all of their technology is, is in that same office. And so you, it's really close to their, uh, their internet um, modem and router. And so it's, uh, it's just convenient to install it there. It's also silent. So it's not going to uh, cause any noise uh, that, would, uh, that would bother anybody sitting around it. All right. So we have the compact bridge, the smaller, small form, fanless, uh, fanless chassis, uh, has a couple of different options built into a different series models. And then we can move over and talk about the rack mount bridges. So when we're talking about the rack, it's still the same, you know, the, the process, the architecture is still the same, but we're gonna provide a device that can easily be installed into 
a standard four post or network closet rack. Uh, Ricky, anything that you want to speak to towards on, on the rack bridges? Uh, definitely. So you've got, um, you've, you've got moving fans in here. So, you know, they, they sound like a, you know, like a standard desktop computer. Um, but you know, then that, that's something that makes that humming noise and, you know, uh, and it's got to move air over, over the components inside. And so, uh, with that in mind, um, you know, these rack mount bridges aren't really the best to install, you know, right next to a user. So, uh, normally if, you know, if they've already got a, uh, a small network cabinet, um, these fit great in them. They're, they normally take, you know, one U of space. So they're not that large and they're about a uh, quarter length. So about half a pizza box. Um, so they don't, you know, once again, they don't, they don't use too much space, but you know, they're just as powerful as the, uh, the small form factors. Yeah. Kind of, they, they fit into the rest of your network stack, just like any other network appliance. So, all right, great. So Ricky, it would be really good if maybe you would just spend a few moments talking about sort of the, the genesis of the bridge and then the evolution over what you've witnessed with your several years now with Eagle Eye. So definitely when I first started, uh, we had the, 100 series and then we had a 200 series and we finally got to the 300 series that you've uh, you know come accustomed to um it's uh the 300 series when we first started three meant 15 hd cameras um and then four meant 30 hd cameras a uh, quick note there when we say hd cameras we mean uh 1.3 megapixel 720 uh you know, the resolution of 720 cameras uh, so if you've got three megapixel cameras, then you're going to, the 301 will only be able to do five cameras. So yeah, it's a, essentially it's, it's a combination of your camera count plus your resolution. When we're saying HD cameras, we're assuming one megapixel cameras, but that could also be three, five megapixel, three, five cameras. megapixel cameras. cameras. So yeah, some quick math there to, to show you how much they can actually, actually handle. Um, so yeah, so we went from 301 and 401 and then, uh, Eventually uh, decided to, you know, pop an analog card in one of them and, and call that the 310 series and the 410 series. Um, and so that's where that comes from. And then it kind of started getting away from us there, right? So it, it, we wish that it could, uh, you know, stay as, uh, as, as nice and simple as that. But you know, there's just things out there that uh, our customers wanted that we had to create for them. So then uh, we moved to the 303 and the 403. Um, and that added eight PoE ports built into the um, to the bridge. So if you've got only eight cameras, uh, the 303 and the 403 are, are great for that. Um, you can always pop a or attach a, a secondary PoE switch to that and expand on it. But for folks that have uh, lower camera counts, uh, you know, it's, it's perfect for them. Um, and then this past year, um, you know, we started doing some other um, other things with analytics and the way that we pulled video from the cameras. And so we had to come up with a solution for folks that were doing a lot of analytics. Um, and so that's where the 501 was born. So it's, uh, it's in the same form factor as all the other uh, standard rack mount bridge models. Um, it just has a much beefier uh, processor and memory um, in it. Um, and you'll see a nice little asterisk there. Uh, and it says more power for video analytics and single stream. Uh, video analytics are, you know, pretty uh, self-explanatory, but single stream is uh, something that we ran into um, for a couple of use cases. Um, some cameras can't provide the two streams that we require. And so um, we had to devise a way to pull just one H.264 stream and break out that secondary stream that we needed for preview upload. So that's all happening on the bridge. And because that's all happening on the bridge, it really weighs down the, uh, uh, the, the processing power of that. So uh, single stream uh, uh, came about and we had to, we had to deal with it. And so you know, that's what the 501. Uh, All right. Yeah. So thank you. So uh, now let's move over to CMVRs. Um, just like with the bridge, we, we realized that we need to be able to offer a compact CMVR. And because of the fact that the chassis of these devices, there's not that much of a variation. We're simply, putting in different types of hard drives, additional hard drives, and you know, when needed additional CPU processing output in order to handle larger counts of, of cameras or to uh, handle extended storage requirements. 
but essentially it's still the same thing and it's still the same architecture. So we have a compact CMVR version of the exact same uh, component that is you find in the compact bridges, except that it has that additional storage. We calculate that storage based off of the balance or the load that we're going to be putting onto the system. So when you're reaching out to your pre-sales uh, resources at Eagle Eye Networks, we're talking about things about the bandwidth and then how that correlates to how much video at what resolution needs to get up to the cloud at what speed to ensure that the quality is, is what is expected. And then we get to scenarios where that may not be possible. We understand that network infrastructure isn't at a place around the entire world where you can just stream high definition video to the cloud, or you may run into a scenario where either through, uh, through something that's being required by the law or simply the way that the customer's business wants to operate, they're going to require redundancy or local retention and cloud storage, or maybe they just want flexibility. That's where the CMVR comes in. And then the same thought process involved with the compact bridges applies to the CMVRs. You're going to maybe put this device in a manager's closet at a quick serve uh, restaurant and that manager's closet's probably very tight with space and there may just be a small shelf up above the desk. Well, this is the perfect device to put up there. And because it's flexible with how it can handle video locally or in the cloud, you know, as the bandwidth improves at that location, you can start moving things to the cloud. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So one thing it shows, uh, one of the considerations there is, um, you know, low bandwidth. Uh, people reach out and, you know, they, they don't have enough bandwidth for the amount of cameras that they want. Low bandwidth does not necessarily mean no bandwidth, right? So you've got to have some bandwidth in order to view your videos. It's, it's not that magical. I wish it were. Um, so you've got to take in consideration how many people will be viewing videos and then how high of a resolution are your cameras. If you've got a 10, um, a 10 megapixel camera um, and you only have two megabits per second up, that's going to be a pretty bad experience. So that's all you know, things that need to be considered when choosing uh, whether you want to go with bridge or CMVR and even what CMVR you want on there. All right. So we have rack CMVRs. We've talked about the compact. We have the same sort of setup as we have with the bridges. We have rack mountable CM CMVRs for the same reasons. So that's your 320, your 420, your 330, and your 430. They still uh, have the same hybrid abilities as you would have with the 410, for example, that's a combo unit that can do analog cameras and network cameras. So we offer the CMVR version of that 410, uh, which translates to a 420, or excuse me, a 430 with the analog component added to it. Uh, the storage options range depending on which unit you, you get. So we have anywhere from four terabytes up to 10 terabytes in our standard rack CMVRs. Uh, and we can talk in just a moment about uh, how you can get expanded storage beyond that if you need it. Ricky, do you have anything that you want to add for rack CMVRs? Uh, sure. So what we're noticing here is with that, you know, the nomenclature is sort of sticking to where we were. So we've got the three does 15 HD, the four does, does 30. That two, you know, in the middle uh, signifies that it's a CMVR. And then we, when we add the analog, we add that two to the, uh, to the one, and now we got the 330 and the 430. So it makes sense after you've uh, studied it for a little bit, I promise. All right, so now we need to talk about the big dogs, right? The, the enterprise CMVRs. These are the units that you're bringing in when you need heavy duty horsepower, long-term retention. Uh, you need the ability to have an expansion of your system at, the, at a moment's notice. So you put in a larger enterprise system. Uh, whether or not you want to distribute that load across smaller units or you want to bring it back to a centralized location uh, will determine sort of how your hardware build is going to end up looking at the end of the, at the, end of the pre-sales process. So we have a 520, we have a 620, and we have an 820. The 820 is the biggest uh, unit that we have out there. It's up to 55 terabytes. It's usable RAID configured storage. The 620 and the 520 have 27 terabytes and 17 respectively. Um, and all of those are the usable storage capacity after the RAID configuration. 
all of these units have a hot swappable hard drive uh, setup array in them. So if there is a hard drive failure, you have the ability because of the RAID configuration to just simply pull out the one that's failed, replace it with a new one, and then the system will reconfigure that drive to fit into the RAID. The 820, it's a very big unit. It does require uh, two people ideally to put it in. We don't want anybody you know, hurting their backs. And you, have to do, you do have to consider that it is a two, uni, uh, two U unit. So it's gonna take up more space than your standard network appliance that you're putting in a rack. Uh, these units should all definitely be installed in a closet. Uh, because of the amount of power that these things are, are processing, because of the, the stuff that's happening under the hood, uh, it, you know, it's a high performance machine. And because of that, we have to keep it cool. And we have to do that in a manner that uh, doesn't always lend itself to, to the most pleasing audio, audio, audible experience, excuse me. So just keep that in mind. You want to have this thing put in a closet where it can churn and it can do its, its business, uh, it, you know, and, and not disturb anyone. Uh, Ricky, any other things they, that you want to? Yeah, sure. They, they also get, you know, pretty hot compared to the other ones. So uh, it needs to be an environment that has, you know, HVAC designed specifically for, um, you know, enterprise level uh, servers. Uh, the 820, you know, it sounds like a jet engine. It really does, uh, especially when it first starts up. Um, and there's no adjusting that. Uh, we've had calls to see if we could turn the fans down so that it wouldn't be as loud. Um, you know, we, you know, we have a way to do that, but it's not going to be great for the system in the long run. So uh, it's, it's probably better uh, just to consider that before in installing one of these units. And, you know, one other thing to mention is just because you have 50 cameras doesn't mean that you need the 520. Um, if you've got plenty of bandwidth, you can use, you know, a couple of bridges or a couple of other smaller CMBRs if you've got, you know, scenarios where you don't have, um, you know, an enterprise grade uh, network closet. Yeah, that uh, that sound you hearing you hear is is not a, a jet taking off. It's a, the eagle soaring. Is the jetty okay? I'll all right. So I'll consider that. So all of the devices that we've talked about, uh, whether you're you're talking about a CMVR, or you're talking about a bridge, th these five bullet points here don't change. Okay, the the idea of how our system works, the, the logical architecture of it remains the same. And at the end of the stream, or at the end of the uh, interface where the end user logs in behind that nice piece of glass and sees all of their cameras, they don't notice a difference between a bridge or a CMVR. Accessing the video doesn't change. Accessing the configurations of the system doesn't change. The user's experience is built off of the API in the cloud and everything that's happening around that is sort of in the background. That's, that's for Eagle Eye Networks and for your, your valued uh, partner or your reseller to, to worry about. So we're talking about things about easy setup. Uh, I have a lot of years of experience putting together a host of various manufacturers' products. And I can tell you that one of the things that drew me to Eagle Eye on the integrator side was the fact that it was so easy to set up. So the, the, the deployment of my team uh, was a different sort of consideration when it, be, when it came to Eagle Eye Networks. It, it didn't require the same level of proficiency that uh, that a lot of the other systems require. The no configuration of firewalls or routers, that's also a big one. Ricky, do you maybe wanna to speak to that point? Uh, sure, yeah, so um, I get a lot of phone calls um, you know, with new installers and they've overcomplicated the whole setup process. And they're, you know, they're trying to, you know, figure out how to set up all the cameras on the, on the bridge. And it's like, you know, first thing you have to do is log into the account and add the bridge there. And once they realize that it's easier than they've they planned for, um, you know, their, their project moves along a lot faster. Uh, same thing with the network guys. The network guys are wanting to do port forwarding and, you know, they, they've got all this, you know, the old mindset of doing things for, you know, that they've been doing for 20 or 30 years, um, it sort of all goes away. Uh, we can still lock down their network. We can, you know, we can hard close every in, inbound port. That's, that's just fine. Uh, we can whitelist their IP address. We can, you know, do static IPs. That, that that's that's no problem, um, but we don't have to do any of the port forwarding or uh, opening inbound ports that um, that they're, they're they're totally used to. So a lot of the uh, the IT guys you know, love that fact. Yeah, I think you you hit on the main point of that is the we're not opening we're not opening inbound communications or pathways into the customer's network. So. We're, 
we're not trying to provide security and then inadvertently making things less secure because somebody needs to be able to access something from outside the network. Everything happens out to the cloud and then all of your engagement from that point forward is just to the cloud. Uh, so the bridge device, as we talked about at the very beginning, this is a device, it's, it's a specialized, essentially a specialized computer that is built to receive and analyze the video stream from the cameras. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with the buffering is not just in regards to how we manage the network or how we protect from network outages, <clears throat> it also provides us a lot of, of really cool ways that we can analyze video because we are able to buffer high resolution as we're analyzing the substream which is just a better, um, it, it provides us a better, a better canvas to analyze. So uh, that's an important feature of the bridge as well that you, you wouldn't be able to get at this point with the technology that's available. You wouldn't be able to get that level of, of analysis to be done on an edge device. The, the processing's just not there. And that covers the on-premise buffering for bandwidth management. The bandwidth management is a system that's built into the dashboard. The reseller has access to it. The end user can have access to it. Uh, it is a really powerful tool to control exactly how this machine is going to impact the network, which was a big concern for a long time and sort of slowed the adoption of network video surveillance simply because of the fact that high resolution video eats a lot of, of, of bandwidth, which can affect operations. So uh, we realize that that needs to be something that's at the front of, of how we are going to consider this, this product being implemented onto your network. And then we, we give you the tool to, to make sure that it's done your way. And ultimately all of that data, you know, automatically, or if you choose to, you have the option to put it onto on demand uh, through the transmission mode. But ideally, autom automatically, all of that data transmits to the Eagle Eye Cloud. And the Eagle Eye Cloud is a purpose-built private cloud infrastructure uh, that is designed with video surveillance at the very forefront of, of the architecture. Uh, it, Ricky, if you want to maybe just speak a little bit about the cloud or about our cloud infrastructure, I think it's a useful... Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that and you know it really impresses me about our cloud is how much data we're storing um i mean we're talking petabytes you know no, no longer terabytes we're, we're moving on into petabytes and and we're adding those you know, you know quite fast um and if you've ever priced out uh you know other third party um you know cloud storage solutions um you know such as aws or azure uh their storage is pretty expensive. And so we wouldn't be able to, you know, compete in the industry if we had to pay a third party to store the, the video for us. And so we just find that it's, uh, or Dean found that it's much more economical to, you know, rack and stack our own uh, hard drives and, and, uh, and, and expand on those as needed. Um, yeah, we, we kind of hit it on it in last week's webinar, if, if any of you uh, were able to join us for that. So the private cloud is really one of the main benefits is that you're you're joining this sort of private club where the more people that are getting in and utilizing the service the lower cost the resources become over time uh, because you're pooling resources which is a major component of cloud computing uh, which you still have that component there with with public cloud but you you don't have the ability to really determine what those resources are designed for and how the implementation of those resources can be uh, kind of flexible in that we only use our cloud for video for Eagle Eye Networks, whereas the other public cloud providers, they have to sort of have a generic slate of how they can offer their cloud infrastructure because you can use it for video, you can use it for storing metadata, you can use it for storing uh, family photos, you know, writing your own apps. And that's a kind of a different type of infrastructure, a different type of way that that cloud's gonna operate. And then ultimately, you know, if you get into a, a situation with one of the public clouds that they start to raise prices on you, you don't really have a lot of recourse where when you're in with a private cloud, you're in with a community that helps to determine what that final cost is gonna to be to the consumer. Uh, so it's just sort of a, a better, um, it's a better way to go about things, especially when you're talking about something as sensitive as video surveillance. So uh, 
Ricky, this is the, our last slide before we move into the to the Q and A section, and we do we do have a couple of questions that are are teed up. I do want to say uh, real quickly, if you feel like you have a question, please put it out there. Uh, the, this is meant to be a, uh, an educational webinar. The purpose of this webinar uh, drives from the fact that we do still have a lot of questions that come across the sales engineer table about the differences between bridges and CMVRs. And because we work in that space all the time, to us, it does seem sort of very simple and easy to explain. But, you know, we understand that even though you've, you've sat through the, the past 20 so minutes of the webinar, you may still have questions. So please don't be shy. Uh, go ahead and throw those questions in the Q&A. Uh, Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you real quick to talk through this last slide. I, I just want to say that this is my, one of my favorite slides because it has so many different aspects of cloud computing and how Eagle Eye Networks leverages the cloud represented in these graphics. But I know that we're specifically talking about Eagle Eye bridges versus Eagle Eye CMVR. So I'll let you run with that. Oh, I, I think you covered the, the best parts, but either way, I'll, I'll clean up from here. So, um, you know, in any um, deployment with multiple locations, you're going to have different environments everywhere. So uh, some places may require a compact bridge or CMVR. Some places are going to have analog. Um, you know, some places are going to have hundreds and hundreds of cameras. And so what's really great about Eagle Eye is we're able to take all of those different lo locations and put them on one user interface. So when a user logs in, they're able to see all of their cameras from all the different locations without having to, uh, to log into different IP addresses, um, you know, without having to do any, any work on their, on their end. Um, so it really makes it as easy as possible to deploy and to use for the, uh, for the end users. And I think if there was one thing to add to this, the, the graphic that we look at on the right shows a location one, a location two, and a location three, and each one of those are represented with one piece of hardware. But we do want to make sure to, to clarify, you can have multiple pieces of hardware put onto one central network in, say, for example, location one. That could be one Eagle Eye Bridge 401, and then right down the line, you have another Eagle Eye Bridge 420, and then a little bit further down the line, you have an Eagle Eye Bridge 304. All of our hardware can be what we call stacked into the network, and then you just balance the camera load accordingly. And that's something that working with your sales engineer team, we can help you take a look at your project, figure out your network topology, answer a few basic questions, and then that gives us a really uh, good way of, of sort of developing several different solution options. So we always want to make sure that we're kind of bringing a layered approach to, to the issue and giving you multiple layers to consider for however you want to implement the system. And uh, one really cool example of that is our friends over at Capital Factory. Um, they're a uh, startup incubator in downtown Austin. They're, you know, they live in this 16 floor building. Um, when they first started, they had the, the, the 16 floor. And, and so it was easy. We went and popped in a bridge and added some cameras. But then they started adding, um, adding on and, and, and they went to the first floor. So now we had to, you know, rather than having to consider how we're going to get a fiber line all the way down the elevator shaft, uh, we just popped in another bridge on the first floor. Um, and then they added the fifth floor and, you know, same thing. We just added new bridges, new, new bridge hardware there, and the eighth floor, and, and they can do every floor in there. And it's, it's not going to be a, a huge burden or a huge cost for them to get that fiber down the elevator shaft to, to home run everything. So you, you really got to consider this for, you know, companies that are expanding out, you know, a, a new, a new company may have one site, but you know, they don't plan on stopping there. Uh, none of them in the history of companies have ever stopped at, you know, having just one site. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so let's, I know that everyone's uh, really busy, so let's roll this over to some questions. We have a couple that are starting to come in now and we certainly appreciate uh, your questions and, and we hope to get them answered uh, in an adequate fashion. If you do not get an answer to your question or if something pops into your mind as, as soon as you end up uh, hitting the X on the, on the webinar window, please feel free to email us directly. So you can reach any of the sales engineers at se at een.com. But okay, so let's go to our first question. This is from Michael. I have a remote site with two cameras, no internet. How can I utilize your bridge in this setup? I'll let you take that fun one, Ricky. So uh, that, 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 that is a fun one. Um, depending on how remote this site is um, and how much budget the customer has, uh, they're going to want to consider using a mobile broadband solution. Um, 
And, you know, there's different solutions for, you know, all around the world. So I can't tell you which one to use. Um, but it really depends on how remote the site is, honestly. I mean, um, if this, uh, if you're talking, you know, out, out in the jungle of Bolivia, it's not, I don't know if they have jungles in Bolivia, but if they, you know, if they do, um, and there's no cell phone service there, then you shouldn't expect to get, uh, you know, in, any data from, you know, for your video either. Uh, I mean, you can consider satellite link, but that's, you know, once again, uh, going to be the expensive way to go. Um, so there's mobile, mobile broadband to consider there. Um, and, you know, we have lots of uh, customers using that around the world. There just has to be a, a big need for surveillance in that, in that area. Yeah. yeah so ultimately the, the, the main answer or the key component to the question is the no internet part. And you said it earlier, we work great in low bandwidth. We have a solution for that, but we cannot work in no bandwidth. So no matter what, because we are a cloud solution, VSAS product, you're going to need the internet in some form or fashion. And uh, Ricky hit on, on a lot of different ways that you can consider how to get access to the internet. We do have a cellular one pager that we can make available to you if you'd like that kind of explains how Eagle Eye Networks uh, VMS works in conjunction with cellular applications. Great All right. question, Mike. Yeah, second question. So uh, from Vanessa, how do you do public view monitor or multiple monitors? I'm guessing for local display or for a video wall. So for a local display, so um, we do have uh, the ability to connect one monitor to each one of our bridges or CMVRs. Um, most of them have HDMI, some of them have VGA. So depending on which one you uh, get, um, that's going to provide uh, the low resolution um, layouts uh, for you there. Um, and then you can, uh, you can use your keyboard to uh, you know, click around to the different cameras and then pull in the high resolution when needed. Um, our bridge's main objective is to handle those cameras though. Um, and so we, we don't really uh, you know, put a lot of focus on that local uh, graphics pro processing for a monitor. Uh, we're working on uh, you know, uh, adding on to that right now. Uh, but at this point, we, we have uh, some, some partners. One of the big ones is IO Nodes. They didn't pay me to say that. I wish they would. Uh, but IO Nodes uh, makes a specialty device that can do either one or two cameras per unit um, so that if you do need a, a, a full resolution local display, um, you can have that in conjunction with Eagle Eye. All right. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for your question. So uh, this is a question from Russell. Uh, Russell would like for us to talk about our relationship with Brevo and uh, which specific uh, solutions are recommended for integration with Brevo. I'm going to just throw a little bit on that and then I'll let you jump in with it. Uh, our relationship with Brevo is great. I mean, we, we, uh, we integrate with, with Brevo uh, with probably this, the most easy integration that I've ever seen in my career. And I come from a time when being an integrator meant that you're, you're, touching cables together, you're creating uh, custom SDKs or drivers, you're, you're working with multiple manufacturers and trying to get everyone to a vendor meet to, to discuss how this integration is going to occur and ultimately end up with either a lot of, a lot of uh, man hours dedicated to it or a lot of highly paid technical um, assets that are working on it, which all that translates to the cost of the project, which means that for a long time, integration between access and video control was a very expensive undertaking. Uh, Brevo, simple, you know, they've, they've simplified that process on the access side, and we've simplified the process on the video side through an open API integration. And I think, Ricky, that's where you could step in and kind of just really explain the API integration. And then maybe if there's a couple of very specific solutions that we can help Russell with. So yeah, um, at this point, we have hundreds, maybe thousands of other companies integrating with our API, um, sometimes without us even knowing about it, because all the information is, is public. You can go to our website and find um, all, you know, all of the documentation for our API, and it's constantly being updated. Um, Brevo was a great example of a company that took our API and pretty much overnight created an integration, um, you know, for the, for themselves. Uh, and it's as simple to set up. Like Jody said, you create a user on Eagle Eye, you attach that to the Brevo, uh, uh, account and then bang, you're, you're viewing cameras, uh, 
um, you know, through your Brevo app. So it's, uh, it's super simple to set up, easy to use, and uh, our users love it. All right, thank you, Ricky. Uh, we have two questions, uh, Alicio and, and Ash and Afi. Uh, we're gonna, your, your questions are very similar, so I'm gonna put them together and we're gonna answer both of them uh, with, our, with our single answer. So the, the two questions together, if I have third-party cameras, would I need to use a bridge plus a CMVR for a low bandwidth location, or do I only need to use a bridge? I mean, excuse me, or do I only need to use a CMVR? And then the second question was, can we use other cameras with your bridge? Uh, the easy answer for both of those is yes. And then the more complicated answer for Alicio's question in particular, do I need to use a bridge plus a CMVR for low bandwidth? Uh, no, not at all. Um, you, if you have low bandwidth, you can just choose the CMVR um, and you will take it from there. Um, there's no need to use the two in conjunction. Um, so, you know, keep in mind each, you know, each location of cameras um, and uh, I guess we can go back to a, a graphic to show that, but the cameras are going to connect to one bridge and that bridge connects out to the internet. Um, or the cameras connect to one CMVR and, they, and that CMVR connects out to the internet. If you need to stack those uh, to facilitate multiple different, or I mean, uh, uh, heavy loads of cameras, if you've got 100 cameras, you can, you can just stack a few bridges on top of each other to handle those. But each set of cameras will connect to that, that one bridge. So um, no, if you have a low bandwidth situation, you need CMVR. If you've got plenty of bandwidth or super low camera count, um, then you need bridge. And the CMVR has the flexibility to go to the cloud if you wanted to, uh, or if you want to do both. That's correct. So that kind of future proofs uh, a, a system for you. If a company has low bandwidth today, they may not in the future. So if they've got you know low bandwidth today, you could pop in a CMVR. And as times change, as they you know as fiber or uh, 5G or whatever whatever the next uh, um, accomplishment is then they can easily uh, just change their camera settings and, and start streaming them all to the cloud. So it's very flexible. And then specifically with the other cameras, third-party cameras, can you use other cameras? Yes. So we, we always make sure to specify that we can support, you know, probably over 2000 models of cameras across 50 different brand manufacturers. But there are some things that we need to consider with those. So what we're doing is we're looking at, does this camera conform to OnViv Profile S standards? And does this camera provide dual codec, dual stream? Uh, those two features are criteria for support, but it still doesn't necessarily mean that that camera can be supported. The best thing to do is to first check our camera compatibility list that's found at EEN.com under the support tab, very easy to get to. There's a dynamic search filter where you can type in your camera model, your camera brand, features about your camera like PTZ or Fisheye, for example. If the camera appears in that list, it's supported, it's known good, it's been connected to a bridge somewhere in the world, and it works. If there are any issues with the full features that are available from that camera through that OnViv uh, connection, then there should be a note there of outlying that feature or that issue that may be presented with that particular feature. But ultimately, the best way to know for sure if a camera is not found on that list, but it meets those criteria of OnViv and the dual codec, dual stream, you'd need to connect it to a bridge. And when you connect it to a bridge, a very easy, simple button pops up that you click and that button will uh, put in a, a request to our camera engineer support department and they will work on providing that support. If something comes up through the testing of that support that they cannot utilize every feature on that camera, that's generally related to the way that the manufacturer has implemented the OnViv you know, standards within their camera. And that's something that we just, we don't have control over. So we do always wanna make sure that we're setting expectations uh, very clearly. We support a lot of cameras. Chances are if you're using professional grade video surveillance cameras, they're probably already on the list or it's not a problem to get them put onto that list. Uh, when you start looking into the prosumer grade or the, you know, the, the sort of off-brand stuff, that stuff you really wanna make sure that you're, you're going through the pre-sales channels appropriately before you commit to those cameras working with the system. Um, Real quick, uh, just to uh, hit, uh, hit on that, um, these, uh, the support can be written for an un unsupported camera in the time of about you know, one or two days to a couple of weeks, depending on how complicated the camera is. 
Um, and just because we can't uh, you know, fully support the camera doesn't mean that you still can't add it to the Eagle Eye Bridge. Um, as long as the camera can support RTSP, which most of them do, we can add it the old school way. All right, thank you. So we have uh, one last question and then we're gonna wrap this up. We appreciate everyone's uh, involvement. We certainly wanted to, we were hoping that this would become more of a, an open forum for conversation, which uh, everyone's been doing a good job of getting some questions in. So the last question Ashnafi asks, uh, so if cloud services are down, what is an alternative option? Uh, whether it's a bridge or a CMVR, we've, we've hit on the fact of a, a couple times that we are buffering that video locally. If the cloud services are down, to me that implies Eagle Eye Network's cloud is down. Do you want to speak towards that, Ricky? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we're, uh, we're a technology company and uh, we strive to be perfect. Um, sometimes uh, we uh, run into the, 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 the speed bumps that everybody else does. So if, you know, for some reason you can't log in, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate. We're, we're working as hard as we can to get that, you know, back up. But um, you know, keep in mind, your bridge is still buffering that video locally. So we're not losing any data. It's still uh, on your local machine. So as soon as our services come back up, you're able to, uh, to view the video that, that, uh, that you weren't able to before. Uh, and same thing, if uh, your local internet goes down, um, the bridge is still doing its job of buffering that video. Um, as soon as internet service is restored, that video will continue its path back to the cloud. Yeah, and, and we should also mention that, uh, you know, our uptime record is, is pretty good with Eagle Eye Networks. Like you said, this is a realistic problem for anyone that provides the types of services that we do, but don't let that uh, be of any concern to you. We have a, a, an uptime record that's pretty good, and we're always very proactive about making sure that we're addressing any sort of outages immediately, communicating with anyone uh, end users. And then ultimately, as Ricky hit on, because of the design of the way our system buffers video, you do not have to worry about, about losing video in that event. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you for, for your attendance to the webinar. We're going to wrap this up, but we do want to say that you do have a couple of last steps. I'm going to turn this over to back over to our marketing team because uh, she has a better voice than we do. So again, thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, please reach out to the sales engineers, se at en.com. Uh, thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Jody. And yeah, so we'll see you guys next time. Send us your emails and give us a call. All right, everybody. Hello, back to Heather. I'm just going to go ahead and close it off here. Um, so these are the next steps for you. Thank you so much for joining us all the way till the end of the webinar. But uh, if you have any remaining questions that we didn't get to address today, make sure you give us a call, send us an email. Um, we can set up a demo and give you further information about our product. Also, after this webinar, you'll want to check your email. We will have a recording available for everybody. And we we'll also have some further information on this topic. And if you aren't a reseller and are interested in becoming one, also go ahead and give us a call and we can give you the next steps for that. Thank you so much to our presenters, Jody and Ricky, today. This concludes the end of our webinar.